Jonathan Stevens here from Lightwheel, and today we're going to talk about robotics with Spencer and Huang. Spencer, nice to meet you. Wonderful to meet you, man. Give us a little bit about what's the greatest going sure. on here with robotics. So, so let's give context first. Uh, one of the hardest things in, in robotic simulation is really the physics engine, and okay. especially when we're trying to do things like uh, soft body deformables, when we're trying to do things that are dexterous grasping. These are things that are a little bit beyond what we had built PhysX for. PhysX is, is an absolutely fine-tuned machine uh, for large-scale environments, and so things like Mega, which you're standing right mm -hmm. next to, um, absolutely uh, takes advantage of the PhysX engines. Okay. However, in the case of uh, general dexterous robotics, we need to have a whole bunch of different things. We need to have different types of solvers, and it's like you know, visio tactile solvers. We're going to need things like different contact models. We need soft bodies. All of these things typically get developed in a bit of a silo, and so Newton allows us to bring it under a single API, a single interface, and so that way you can take these different solvers that various teams are working on, and then couple them together into a single simulation. Now, Isaac Lab is our robot learning framework, and what we've done over the last year is really slimmed it down so that way it becomes more advantageous to the robotics developer. And so what you're seeing here is a, is a locomotion policy that was trained in 15 minutes with Isaac Lab, and if I can click on it, we can follow it around. Um, but it has a whole body controller that we can now navigate uh, ourselves. And so one of the benefits of being able to use GPU accelerated, uh, our GPU accelerated stack for robot learning is that now we can actually start training these policies really, really quickly. Okay. But more importantly, once you start getting outside of these locomotive policies, maybe we want to start doing some physics. And so on this side, we have Newton. So this is the Newton simulator. It's already open source. You can go ahead and grab it. Uh, on the right side, we have a few of these different examples. Uh, and so what we're able to do is finally bring in these various different types of solvers and these different types of, of um, physics requirements into a single engine. And so this is uh, the Newton viewer, which allows us to view uh, what's happening inside of the simulation at any given time. Uh, this guy's just going to walk right off the screen and keep going. Um, but there are things, uh, as you can tell, with deformable uh, terrain. We even have things if you want to work on uh, cloth twisting, especially. Yep, uh, the other types of, of um, workloads that are really going to become important in the future are going to be cabling. Okay. And cabling is pretty much any type of, of uh, linear deformable. And so you can imagine it being the threads uh, inside of uh, elastic suits. You're going to have things like power cables, Ethernet mm -hmm. cables, copper cabling going inside of cars. And so this is one of the most the most um, asked for uh, use cases because it's used heavily in production, especially in industrial manufacturing, whether it's cars, airplanes, mm -hmm. our general electronics and facilities. And so what we're trying to do is bring this to life uh, and give developers the opportunity to have a single unified interface, bring it all together, make sure they have interop between all of their all their tool sets. And so when you're using Newton, because it's open source, it's, it's freely available, uh, you can leverage it by uh, you know, using MJ Warp, for instance. And then if you're doing work in MJ Warp and you want to transition over to Isaac lab, it makes it that much easier. And so this removes a lot of the friction that causes researchers and developers to be you know, spending upwards of you know, one or two months trying to move all of their scaffolding over. And so now this becomes relatively ubiquitous. Okay. Um, so then, as you're doing this live demo here, what kind of, what kind of hardware would you suggest someone who wants to experiment with this use? Sure. You know, when it comes to robot learning, one of the biggest things is really uh, the on-memory, the uh, on-video cache. You need to have a, good, uh, a relatively beefy memory buffer in order for you to fit as many environments as possible. Mm -hmm. Like, the name of the game is to get as many environments in, uh, in order to have as many of these experiences happening all at once. And so if you imagine, if we were to switch back to Newton and Isaac Lab, uh, this is only a few agents within this simulation. Mm -hmm. But as you've seen in some of our old demos, you'll see that you know we have thousands of right. agents. And so each of these agents, if they need to have perception, they all need to have small tiles of rendering that allow them to have their individual unique experiences within their own little worlds. And so the more, uh, the more, the more environments, the more ability that you have to, to generate these uh, perceptive simulations, uh, the easier it is to train these models uh, and more, more uh, adequately. I would say that if you're trying to get by on uh, local workstation, you know, something like a 5090, anything with 24 gigs and up of RAM will get you like really close uh, for anything that you want to do in a local workstation. But the moment you scale out, you really want to look for uh, things like uh, the DGX systems are really great for non-perceptive learning. So if you don't need to have any types of rendering, you're able to run Isaac Lab directly on DGX, you know, the H100 series, for instance. Uh, take advantage of those tensor cores, take advantage of the large memory footprint. On the other sa that side, we have the RTX 6000s. Mm -hmm. These are going to be part and parcel built for robotics. And so it has the luxury of uh, the Goldilocks zone, where it right. has a large memory footprint, also has the RT cores if you want to do sensor simulation, and it still has the general performance that you would get. Uh, so if I'm running areas. around, at, I have a 5090 at home, and I just want to sandbox, make sure it works, then yeah. I could just 
containerize that package it, put it on the cloud, and just Absolutely. move a million to one instead of thousands yeah. to one on a, on a local compute. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, so right now then, when it comes to training these robots, what do you think still is like the greatest challenge? Like wiring is tough, mm -hmm. you know, some bend and don't bend back, some are sure. flexible, cloth looks really hard. Yeah. Is, is there like one challenge that you guys have been really trying to tackle that has been mm -hmm. the most challenging for, you know, physics and tackling sure. with manipulation? Um, well, if you'll allow me three. Okay, three is great. I'll give you three. Okay, so the three things that we identified are we need to have interoperability at the physics level. We okay. need to be able to, to, as I said, we need to have uh, interop between all of the tool chain. Not every researcher that's developing, let's, let's say for instance that um, I'm in a lab and I'm working on locomotion, someone else is working on dexterity. They may be using entirely different tooling, uh, but they are all relying on some similar technologies. And so the idea is if you have some underlying physics layer that allows them to be leveraging it on either side of the tooling, then when they actually try and combine these together to build a full holistic mm -hmm. system, it's going to be a lot easier. The second is on data representation. Um, we're very used to having multiple different types of file formats, and we're really pushing hard to make USD uh, and, and open USD extremely viable for robotics, and so we're working very hard to build out these robot schemas to make it easier to go from URDF and MJCF and bring those file types into USD, so that way you can leverage them both in Majoka Warp, you can use them in Isaac Lab, and anyone else that's going to be supporting USD. Uh, and I think the third one really comes down to flexibility. You need to be able to have a framework that doesn't uh, hold you uh, hostage with both the rendering and the physics. Okay. And so something that uh, that we're very much looking forward to is, is having uh, Newton as the underlying physics engine because it means that we can now have things like neural learn models mm -hmm. uh, if you want to have uh, learned physics policies. You know, let's uh, take NERD for example if you guys have, have read of uh, Rep on, on that, that's actually mm -hmm. a wonderful paper. And so this means that you could take a uh, physics engine, you could train it as a, as, a, as a neural net and you can bring that in as a separate solver. And so what this means is that you're no longer bound to just some of these research bits, but we have quite a bit of flexibility, including the ability to um, to uh, bring in your own different rendering types, okay. for instance, because uh, Newton is based on warp. Warp is a Pythonic way of developing CUDA kernels, and so you can always do rendering straight through warp. This allows you right. quite a bit of flexibility, meaning that developers don't get landlocked between the tools that are available to them and the types of functionalities that they need. And so those would be the three things. All right. Um, okay, one last question. Sure. Um, I know it's not in this part of this presentation, but uh, I'm seeing that mm -hmm. they have Isaac Groot and Groot Dreams, and yes. we're moving towards, uh, I guess, more and more neural networks, yes. and almost, I don't say, I don't think this is still interacts with it, mm -hmm. but moving towards what uh, Tesla and some of these companies are doing is just get lots of gener mm -hmm. generative world models and train on that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like, as a researcher, people should be focused on keeping up with that, even if they're not using it today? Is that yeah, something that their team should always be Yeah, I, I would with? keep an eye to the wind on that one. And the reason is because we already see that Cosmos can be used for data augmentation. We know that it can be used for generating new forms of data mm -hmm. uh, with Groot Dreams 1. You'll find Groot Dreams 2 that we've announced here at uh, GTCDC is going to allow you to take a world model and condition it with an RGB image as well as actions. And so now you can actually interact with these world models at the same time. And what this starts to unblock is the ability to not only generate generate novel data, but you can start evaluating your policies using these world models, and hopefully eventually we'll even get to the point where we can really start seeing success in, in using these world models for post-training our VLAs, and so doing RL within these world models. Now, the, con the conventional simulators are never replaced in this sense because they're physically they're mm -hmm. physically grounded, and so while a neural simulator allows you to have quite a bit of diversity in the environments and the tasks that you're able to generate, it doesn't mean that the physics is going to be uh, extremely persistent mm -hmm. and it's not going to be extremely accurate. And so as we use a conventional simulator, we're able to generate more and more physics data that we can then train up these, these neural simulators. And so in the future, you can imagine these are working you know, in tandem with each right. other. It's not and an either or situation. It's not an either or. It's yeah. uh, just giving you more and more context for that Absolutely. robot. Absolutely. It's another tool in the toolbox. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Spencer. It's been great meeting you. Wonderful and, meeting you. Um, I look forward to seeing this and putting my hands on it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you.